Good morning. Thank you, Tom and worship team. Wonderful worshiping together. Have you ever thought about how much information you take in every day? I was thinking about this and just thinking how crazy it would have been 30 years ago to hear some of these stats. Some of you aren't even 30 years old, but imagine that you're older just for a moment. Uh, computer stuff is just getting started and mainframes and all of that. And these stats today, do you know that over 5 million Facebook users are under the age of 10? More people in the world own a cell phone than own a toothbrush. <laughs> That's scary. There are over 7 billion people in the world. An estimated 3.7 billion own mobile phones, but only 3.5 billion own toothbrushes. Every second, more than 500 hours of video is added to YouTube. And Snapchat stories, which are about 10 seconds long, approximately 500 million are uploaded every day. An increase of over 400% in the last year. Man, I just think of what it would have been like if somebody would have told me that years ago. That's what was going to happen. I wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know what those words meant, right? Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube. YouTube. No matter how far you go back, though, in history, seeing, hearing, speaking, all those things are important, right? <laughs> Today we're going to look at the story of Jesus healing a man who could not hear and who had a speech impediment. A beautiful picture of the revolution. We've been looking at this in this story series through the gospel of Mark and how Jesus came to overthrow evil, to bring freedom from captivity. And interestingly, this very story we're looking at at the end of Mark chapter 7 is a, is a story from the life of Jesus that was used in the early church at baptism services. So you're going to see how that connects. It's just fascinating to me and the timing of this as well as we get ready to celebrate several people being baptized today. Before we watch the video portrayal of this story from Mark 7, I want to share just a little bit of background from Mark just setting the stage. Remember, Mark is the shortest gospel account written. It's the first one that was written in kind of mid-60s A.D. And Mark is looking at painting this picture of Jesus coming on the scene at the beginning of season three, if you will. Season one was creation, Genesis one and two. Season two, this is my kind of summary of this, trying to put it in a, in a context that we could connect with. Season 2 is Genesis 3 through the end of the Old Testament, Malachi 4. And then the beginning of the Gospels, the New Covenant, the New Testament, this new agreement of God with men and women and with creation begins season 3. Jesus coming on the scene, announcing the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the heavens being torn open. to set people free from evil and begin this process of restoration. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Mark's gospel, his, his account is filled with these subtle hints and clues that go back into the Old Testament, into season two, if you will, which would have been familiar with, to first century Jews. 
who were more than casually familiar with the Old Testament, making them think, hey, I know what he's alluding to here. I never thought about that part of the story in our history as related to what Messiah was going to do now. Or maybe I never really thought of it this way that the Messiah was going to come and he was actually going to overcome through his self-sacrificing love and he wasn't going to come as a political liberator. God's going to rescue us in a different way. He's going to start this rescue operation by freeing us from the inside out. And that's what we're celebrating today, the kingdom coming in people's lives to change us, to transfer us, as it says in Colossians 1, another New Testament letter where it says that he's transferred us from the dominion or authority of evil, of Satan, to the kingdom of his beloved son. There's this transfer that happens, this transfer of ownership, if you will. We're separate, celebrating new ownership today in several people's lives and the rest of us together as well as local church community and those who are somewhere in our journey with Jesus are celebrating this new ownership. So we're going to we're going to watch the video portrayal of this. As I've said before, I love this video series about the life of Jesus because first of all, the guy who plays Jesus looks like he might have been Jewish and from the Middle East rather than having blue eyes and being from South London. Though South London's fine, it's just Jesus wasn't from South London. So here's what I want you to pay attention to as we watch this morning, just a short clip of the end of chapter seven. I want you just to pay attention to the humanity of Jesus in this story. Let's go ahead and watch. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Emphata, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Is that amazing? So I... I love the way they're trying to capture and portray the humanity of Jesus. Sometimes we have this mistaken notion when we think about Jesus healing people that he was just kind of like, boom. It's good, wasn't it? Or some, I mean, just kind of, just that he, we miss out on this, this aspect of his humanity. Jesus was fully God and fully man. The Bible says that Jesus felt power go out of him when he healed the woman with the issue of blood. It says that Jesus at times was deeply moved with compassion. It says that Jesus got exhausted. You know, it's not a sin to be exhausted. Aren't you thankful for that? Jesus... A few people are thankful for that. Everybody else kind of like, what? 
Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, got into the boat. He fell asleep in the boat, and even a storm couldn't wake him up. That's how tired he was. Jesus had to withdraw many times. Mark's gospel recounts this on several occasions. When stuff was going on, Jesus was doing stuff, and, and he had to withdraw. Jesus wept with a broken heart over people. Just a beautiful picture of his humanity and his divinity, him being God and man. And that Jesus is a faithful high priest, so when we pray to him, we know that he can sympathize with our weaknesses, as it says in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. So the main point this morning, what I want to circle back around to as we prepare to celebrate baptisms is Jesus, the words that he spoke to this man when he said, be opened. And there are two aspects to this, obviously, his ears and his mouth. It's a picture not only of physical healing, but of spiritual healing. To be able to hear the words of God that you haven't been able to hear, and to be able to speak freely of Jesus without impediment. So a few things here I just want to highlight. Remember that Jesus, he went up, it says, to the region of Tyre and Sidon, which is current day Lebanon, which was Gentile territory back then. Non-Jewish people lived there. So he left Galilee, predominantly Jewish, went up there, and then it says he went back to this east side of the Sea of Galilee, to the Decapolis. That's where this miracle took place. So Je I love this about Jesus. Is He was always reaching to people who were outsiders. <laughs> people who considered themselves on the outside. When you look at this story... Uh, I mean, it, it, to us, it can seem obviously a little crude that Jesus took spit and put it on the guy's tongue, right? You agree with that or you think that's cool? Okay. So in their day, obviously, they didn't have all the medical technology and advancements that we have, didn't have different kinds of treatment plans. And saliva actually was considered to have healing qualities because it, it came from the life of the person, right? So I'm going to encourage you to kind of get over the hurdle of thinking about it as, ooh, that's gross, and thinking about if you couldn't speak, you'd pretty much let anybody put a little spit on your tongue if you would be free for the rest of your life. Hello? Hello? It says, after he took him aside, away from the crowd. I love this, too, about Jesus. Sometimes he did it right in front of everybody. He healed somebody. And other times, like in this story, I love that portrayal where he just takes the guy and pulls him aside. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said, Ephatha which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Now here's the connection with season two. Here's what's so important to get in this story. This was not just a miracle worker guy that's going around and doing cool stuff. This echoes back to Isaiah 35, and all of Israel would have been familiar with this. Isaiah 35, a beautiful picture of Messiah, and this picture that's painted, Isaiah 35 is a great chapter to read just, just for encouragement and thinking about what's to come and the freedom that Jesus brings now and he will bring in the future. It says, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, 
do not fear. Your God will come. Everybody say, your God will come. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. The sign of God coming to set his people free is that blind eyes would be opened, deaf ears would be unstopped, people would be able to hear and those who were lame would leap for joy. Those who were handicapped would be healed. Those who have any speech issue, they would shout for joy. That's the sign of the kingdom coming. <laughs> N.T. Wright says, this revolution means rescued humans are set free to be what they were made to be. Everything Jesus was about was centered on vanquishing the enemy's empire, taking the world Satan had seized, restoring men and women to their rightful place as image bearers and his representatives on earth. So just to ask you this question, do you see Jesus as the one who heals both spiritually and physically? This is the Jesus that we serve. We live in this in-between place in season three of kingdom conflict. Not every person that we pray for is healed, but every time Jesus heals and sets someone free, the kingdom is coming. It's important, even with our medical advances, that we're ultimately looking to Jesus to heal. As a friend of mine used to say, when I get a headache, I pray first and wait, and then I'll take some aspirin or Advil or whatever. But we look to Jesus as the healer, a posture of faith and trust. John Wimber made this statement, a guy a couple decades ago. Just, I find this so helpful in how we approach healing and the kingdom coming. He says, I urge you to seek not formulas and methods for gaining a temporary reprieve from sickness and death. I urge you to seek the Lord and life giver himself, Jesus Christ. That way, regardless of the visible results, your prayers will always have power for healing. So when we pray for people, we're not trying to do some sort of magic or mind games or anything like that. We're inviting Jesus, the Messiah, the kingdom to come and for him to touch people. And for him to unstop deaf ears, spiritually and physically. And for him to loosen the tongue so that the mouth we would speak freely of Jesus. So when we talk about baptism, we're talking about being immersed in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're talking from the scripture, it's very clear that when you're baptized, you're baptized into the death of Christ. The old is dying and you're rising a new person in Christ. A powerful picture. Do you know that in the early church, Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. Ambrose rec rec recorded this for us and said that whenever people were being baptized, they would place their hands on the ears of every person. By the way, we're not going to do this this morning. And they would take spit, just like you saw in the story, and put it on the tongue. And they would say those words with Mark 7, with Jesus. They would say, be opened. Because baptism was a mark, a demarcation in every person's life that now your ears are being opened to hear and receive the word of Christ. From this day forward, everyone being baptized, your ears would be open to hearing and receiving the word of Christ. 
And secondly, from this day forward, your mouth, your tongue, you would be touched by Jesus so that you could speak freely of who Jesus is and the great things he has done in your life. Hearing and speaking of Jesus. So powerful. Hear and receive God's words, speak of Jesus to others. And I'll just close with this. So this week, I was so encouraged because as I'm preparing for this and thinking about this and realizing, man, I, this is amazing that this was going on in baptisms, right? And I'm thinking about what it means to hear the word, to respond, and then to speak of Jesus to others. And I got this text from a young man. He says he was listening to the podcast of last Sunday's message he, while I was at the gym, while he's at the gym. He says, as you were talking about paying attention to what God is doing, I had to pause the message twice to go talk to people. Both ended up in great conversations involving Jesus. So you imagine yourself at the gym, working out, and you're thinking of this, that my ears are open and so is my mouth. I'm here on this earth for a reason. And then all of a sudden God draws your attention to two different people. He says, I, he paused it, goes over and talks to them. He says, then when I was getting home and pulling in the garage, I saw my neighbor and ended up having a great conversation with him, shared with him and invited him to church. When I did, his face lit up with excitement and sincerity, told me he would love to come. When you think about this, and my prayer this morning is that all of us in looking at this story would say, Jesus, would you baptize me with your, not only with water, but with your spirit? Would you open my ears to hear your word? Would you open my mouth to speak your praise, to speak Jesus of you to others with gratitude? And I'm telling you that all hell resists those two things happening in your life. But you know what's amazing, as Tom was helping us with in worship, is that God's grace covers where sin abounds, grace abounds, love covers a multitude of sins. So to hear the word of Christ and to speak of who he is does not require, it's not a prerequisite to be perfect. It's a prerequisite to be willing to be immersed in Jesus.